Um, and I'd also ask everybody to mute themselves as well, because if you're not muted, then uh, sometimes your your picture can uh, or can jump in when we're when we're going. So just to explain quickly about Case and who we are, we're an, um, a community organization from the English speaking community of the Maurice and the Saint Quebec, with a mission to support the English speaking community and to create bridges with the French speaking community. We have a wide array of programs from health and life, healthy lifestyle to culture and heritage. So if you don't know about us and like to know a little bit more, you can go to our website, which is casemcq.com. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it on to Marilyn. Welcome, Marilyn. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, Julie, do you want to run the PowerPoint or do you want me to? I'll run it. I'm, I've okay, got good. it. Okay. I so, Marilyn sent four PowerPoints and I put them together into two in the order that she said. And, Marilyn, I also have open the picture of your knife. Okay. <laughs> um, if you want to show that to anybody at any time. At the end, we'll show that at the end. Yeah, so I'm just going to see about, I just want to move this. I can't quite see how to do this, this screenshot. Sorry. Hmm. Sorry, folks, I'm just trying to see how to turn off the up up toolbar because I can't quite see how to um ah there we go here we are over to you Marilyn all right well this is my home here and uh I'm going to share with you what I consider the pleasures of perennials Every picture you will see tonight is from my garden. So if you want to go to the next slide, Julie, please. So I live on a farm outside of Danville. We raise Angus beef and we sell horse hay also. I have been gardening for over 45 years and uh, gardening is a passion of mine. And my perennial beds have earned thousands of dollars for local churches in the area. I paint with plants and I use the same canvas sometimes that you'll, you'll notice in some of the pictures you're gonna see that um, the bed that is at my mailbox two years ago was yellow, all shades of yellow and orange, and now it's all shades of pink. It's been completely tore out and, and redone. So like I said, I, I consider myself an artist that paints with plants. In the Danville Garden Contest, they started up two years ago. The first year I got first place and last year I got second place. So, um, and it's funny because it was my neighbor that insisted that I enter the contest. It wasn't something I would have done, but he insisted. <laughs> all right, so, yep, these are all pictures from my garden uh, and around the house. So I have several, several flower beds, as you will see. Now, like I said, in, 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 in another picture, I don't know if I have it on here in my, uh, maybe it was in the virtual tour, tour that I had. It was all yellow two years ago. And this year it, I changed it and it's all in pink now. This is in the front of the house. As you can see, there, there are, individual hostas along the front of the house. And then this is a, a hosta bed that has some lilies, has some irises, has some sedum. Um, 
blocks, um, corabels, master wart. Um, what else is there? That's pretty much what's in those beds. This one's the same kind of, but that's a side bed that sort of flows. It flows that whole front goes into up on the side into this one. So you can see there's phlox, there's uh, lilies, there's corabels again, and lots of hostas. And there's astelbe too next to the, the big tree. I just wanted to 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 say, Marilyn, that you're you're giving us an overview for now, but you're going to go back over each one of these perennials. Yes, if, yes. I'm just up, pointing so. out what there is in the each sort of bed so that you kind of have a, I won't go every plant, but uh, there's also, if you notice, there's one daylily in there, I can see. No, okay. And that's the same flower bed, but from the end. I have over 200 kinds of hostas. And about, uh, I don't know, over 20 daylily, different varieties of daylily. And then this is the back of the front bed. What you saw on the other side was from the roadside. This is what I see from, from the front of the house. So when I design that bed, I have to have it so that it looks good on both sides. And I know just about, I'd say 95% of the hostas, this, the yellow one at the front, the shorter frilly one, that's called pineapple upside down. This is along the side of my house. And, and I just want to point out when you're designing, when you're designing things you and you want to um, camouflage something, I didn't even realize till I looked after and I started I, these garbage bins. I didn't realize that I had planted the green one next to the green dappled plant bush next to the green one and this black, this dark sambuscus is next to the dark one and it's it's, it's kind of neat because it kind of camouflages and a few years ago I decided to splurge on myself and I bought that hydrangea tree and I love that hydrangea tree next this is all my peonies are in the back here there's our dianthus that, that are called pinks that's under the tree, the hydrangea tree. And then I mix in some annuals. And there's also a, a double uh, lily there in between the pot and the bike. Yeah. Yeah. And this is around my deck. Okay, we're going to the next step. Well, we missed I wonder if you could just comment on some of the flowers that are around your deck. Okay, the these um, the ones in the right at the in the middle. That's the, yes, the liatris or gay flower they call it. On the on the right of them, you can see the those are. Echinacea or cone flowers. Um, you can see the few. Uh, it's Cosmia, Cosmia, down at the, the red, right at in front of the clematis on the on the right hand side. On the left hand side, you'll see some more Echinacea. Then there's some Shasta daisy. There's some daylilies right at the step. There's some um, lilies between the daisy sort of, and then my clematis. That clematis there is called Ernest Markham, 
and it starts blossoming in July. And I usually have some blossoms at Halloween. It's got to be one of the longest blooming clematis there are. Um, so it's a variety I very much recommend. Uh, you went backwards. <laughs> Going Sorry, someone to... someone just came into the meeting and it sort of freezes my um okay freezes my there we go. Okay. You didn't want this to comment my... on this? Yeah, this is what I my sort of I call it my sort of woodland garden. Now you're going to see in front of the birch trees, there's some ferns, there's a, an ostrich fern, there's Japanese ferns. And then this, yeah, the yellow blossom there, yeah, that's Coreopsis moonbeam. And then on the other side of that hosta next to it is, no, on the, on the left, yeah, yeah, that's a quince bush. For anybody who doesn't know, it has orange blossoms and it blooms quite early behind it is what is called yellow wax bells they're not supposed to even grow like they're supposed to be zone five but they do well there and behind it is lugaria or ray flower they call it and then there's some daylilies here yeah um this here is a rutabaga. There's um, the lighter colored ones right at the front between the rabbit, around the rabbit there. Yeah, those are type of corabels actually. That one's sort of a caramel color. On the other side is a, a yellow one. Yeah, with red veining, which is really striking. Um, especially if it's, you put it near any red flowers. And then just to the left of there, that, yeah, that grass there isn't supposed to grow here either. Yeah, it's it's a Japanese um, feather grass, I, think, I believe they call it. The one behind it is, uh, is a reed feather reed grass, they call it, the tall. And then the rest are just hostas. So, and then I wanted to, these were, these were supposed to be in our pictures from the other, how it got in here. This was, a, I just wanted to show you what it looks like um, from opposite corners. This is my sanctuary, I call it. And this is from one view. And then the other one is from the opposite corner. And I wanted to show you how, when you're designing a flower bed, you have to take into all views and, and what they look like from all sides. Now you can see in the, in the picture on the left at the center, there's a hydrangea. Next to it, the white blossoms, that's an ashilia that's called the pearl, which I really like. And then you can see some daylilies. Yeah, and on farther up that, sort of yellowish, yeah, that's a bleeding heart. The tall stuff and stuff, the brown stuff, that's that grass, the re the reed grass. And then there's hostas and and you can see the lilies behind this, the spinner. Um, and then on the other picture, you'll see the day lilies in the front and then it's mostly hostas you'll see. And there's, oh, there's a little bit, yeah, that there is Brunera, Brunera. Um, the, they also call it Siberian buglops and some corbels and the rest are hostas. And this is uh, the, the view, um, right by the pond, the, the stream. So you can see how the, that bed is mostly 
white and red, you can see there's the red lilies, the red bee balm, and then you'll see the white, the white uh, lilies and the, and the white uh, Achillea. Now that, that purple thing in the middle isn't really supposed to do very well there, but it seems to survive. Yeah, it's a balloon flower and it, it doesn't like to be moved. So I've left it there because there was a flower bed there years ago before I revamped and made this. And it has a tap root, so it's not easy to move. So I've just left it there. So most everything, and there's some astle bees in here. Um, right behind the, the little gnome, the tall stuff back there, the taller stuff, that's Stimma Jujuja. And um, it's a very pretty burgundy leaf um, that grows right tall and then has white feathery flowers in in September. Um, and I think, oh, and, and then, yeah, okay, yeah. I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, you can see it here between the red, no, go to the next slide. No. Okay, between the two red, there's some leaves there, the funny leaves. Yeah, that's elephant ears, we I'll call it, or Virginia. Um, and that blossoms early in the spring and sometimes late and then later in the summer, um, which is, it's really nice, um, does well there by the stream. So you can just ask to be in hostas basically there. That's all you see. And then you'll see there's an iris, a water iris. You see my bird in flight in that picture? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that like that um the judges when they came to uh judge they they thought that I should make all my big decisions in that swing. They thought that was just a special place. Is that it, Julie, for that? Oh, there's more. Okay, and that's that's just looking into it from a different angle. So, so yeah, those are li lilies over there. Those are uh, a type of Asiatic lily. And um, just above my hand there, um, it looks... Okay, this is my tractor tires. And each year they get filled a different. Okay, I was just gonna say that the just behind my hand there, you'll see it, it looks like something like the flower heads had died, but that's a philandula. And um, it has beautiful pale pink blossoms that you can use like baby's breath in the arrangements. And uh, it's very easy to grow. Now we'll go to my tractor tires. <laughs> so, uh, as you can see, I fill my tractor tires with annuals and then around it, there's some perennial. Here's another view. So this is this brings us to the midpoint. I, I combined the first two uh, the first two segments, and then I have the, the second two segments. But I thought this might be a good opportunity for us to just take a break. People can put on their cameras again and see if anybody has any questions or comments at this stage because Marilyn does have a whole lot, a whole PowerPoint now on how to grow those various perennials. Um, but uh, if anybody has a comment, yes, Janet. Um, what do you do about deer? My, my hostas are 
always well um, yeah, but we have 240 acres and yes we're far enough from from the woods that they have so much feed that they don't have to come get my hosta. Oh, they're they're feeding on my garden, I think. <laughs> but I will tell you there there are several, and if you want me to send more of a, a list, I we can I can make another list. Um, there's many of the plants that I'll be showing tonight that are deer resistant. Okay. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You have such a variety of plants and they're so perfectly spaced and placed and all that. How many years have you been working on these particular flower beds? Let's say in general, but also that particular one that you call your sanctuary. How many years have you been working on that? Oh yeah, but um, I planted that right off. Uh, well, no, about, I think it's about eight years I've had that one, but I keep, playing with it a bit, but the, the basic design has stayed the same since the day I made it. Um, but I've just uh, um, maybe color coordinated more a little bit, like um, because along that side, I try to make as much as possible um, the reds and the whites now. Um, I have one flower bed that is white, red, and purple. I have one that's just shades of pink. I have one that's yellows and oranges and reds and um, I'm I'm getting fussy in my old, old age. <laughs> I think you'd wanted to include a section on garden design in this PowerPoint but you felt that it might be better if we did it in person perhaps in the summer and you know it's easier to show and describe. Yeah. And, the actual uh, design and I would suggest doing one and at the same time I could show how to divide perennials which is uh something to, uh, to learn. So if there's uh, if there's not any other questions or comments, maybe. Oh, Sharon, yeah, Sharon. Sharon has one. Yes, I have two questions. I didn't notice any mulch on any of your flower beds. That's the first question. And secondly, uh, you pointed out some of your Asiatic lilies. I've avoided them for the last 10, 12 years because of those little orange bugs that eat them. And I just, I quit, you know, I raised the white flag and said, no more. So, uh, okay, what do you say? <laughs> okay, I do have a couple, some beds mulched. Um, when, I, when I'm when i happy with a bed, I'll mulch it. If there's things I don't want seeded, I want them, like some things seed themselves like my fever few will will seed itself so i don't want to mulch around it okay in the front of the house i'm not happy with it yet when i'm happy with it maybe i'll mulch it but until i'm happy with the the beds out at the road are mulched and along the, some of this around the stream is just because it's there's a lot and along the house is, is mulched, along the house is mulched, but uh, I do some and, uh, but I find if you, if you keep, if you keep it wet, it's not too bad and you put enough plants in, I don't. Your soil bad. is uh, a heavier soil. It doesn't dry that quickly. Yeah, it's got clay in it. So okay. Okay. even though I've been using compost a lot it, it still holds the moisture pretty good oh, okay okay yeah. thank you yeah. and i spike the lily bill lily bugs i beetles i uh but the lilies are just so beautiful and i have yeah. i have so many and you just go out and and you see a new one each day for weeks and i just well yeah i put up with it <laughs> <laughs> It's a choice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Any other uh, questions or comments before we go to the, the second point of the uh, second part of the PowerPoint? <laughs> so far, so good. Well, you can save your questions for later. Um, so, so please, we'll turn off our, our videos again, and uh, away we go. I'll, I won't mute myself until I finish talking. <laughs>
Okay, I've, I've made up a bunch of slides and like it'll cover most of what I grow and um, I just going to show you a picture of each of the plants and then a, a few comments. So this one was what I was talking about that was at the, the head of the stream there. It's called um, the Achillea, the pearl, and I really like it. Um, but beware that with, with this particular plant, with daisies, with some of the capinulas, um, if you find that your, your blossoming um, the stems droop or fold over or break quickly. They, they have too much fertilizer. They, they actually need it poorer soil, believe it or not. So, um, I, and these ones, they will spread in their place, but they will spread quite a bit. And what I do is in the spring, just take my root knife. So we'll show you a, a picture of that root knife later. Um, and I just cut along where, where I want to keep the plant. And then I just dig it all out and it, it controls it. It's not a big deal in the spring to keep control of it. Has to be, is it a, a, about the only really pretty, real pretty blossoming plant that you can grow in the shade. The only thing it doesn't like is dry conditions. And I found that the red don't multiply as well as pink or white. The, the red um, just sort of seems to stay stagnant and uh, you don't lose them, but you don't gain the way you do with the pinks and the whites. Masterwort, I, maybe a lot of people don't know it, this, but this one will go in shade too. I've had it right on a tree. Um, it, uh, it tells you when it's dry. If it's too dry, it'll start to wilt and you have to water it. But um, it blossoms the end of June, beginning of July. And uh, it's something different. And uh, the leaves are nice to, that make a nice green plant after. The only thing is um, cut off the seeds, uh, the, the, the dead flowers, or you'll, it will seed quite a bit. Baptism, I, I, just, I just got this about, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, and it's, it, it sort of looks sort of like a sweet pea. Uh, the the uh, leaves are, and it makes a really nice green bush after it done blossoming. And again, it's a top root, so it doesn't like being moved very much. I mean, you can move it, but it doesn't. It's, um, it's something that you can grow in dry conditions, uh, but you can also put it where it's uh, a bit wet too. Um, sun or partial shade, and it will last a long time, like you'll This is the Virginia or the elephant ears I was talking about. And this is when it's in blossoming, blossom. So, and I have grown that in all sorts of conditions and uh, it, uh, it lasts a long time too. Brunera is something I think people don't, I, I like it better than um, the forget-me-nots. Why? Because it doesn't seed all over. I found that forget-me-nots and, and, and the blossoms on these are so much prettier. And then it, the leaves, some of them, you can get them, the leaves with some gray, gray in them just so that um, they're attractive. So, so that goes in the shade or semi-shade, it prefers moisture, and yet it, I've had it right under trees and it's done, done okay. Now this grass, Calama growth, growth thesis, or feather, feather grass is easier to say. Um, that's, uh, 
whether you can see it or not, there's actually an outlet on a post there behind it. What I like it is it's great for camouflage. <laughs> you don't even see my post in there. And uh, um, it's this grass is one of the easier ones to grow. I've grown some others and they haven't lasted, but this stuff lasts. I have not lost any and it's just got big, bigger clumps. So I'm really happy with it. So it grows in well-drained soil and there's little maintenance to it. Come at us. <laughs> Now this, this purple one is called multi-blue. And this picture doesn't do it justice. It, it looks effervescent. It, it's incredible to see it. It's um, people, everybody who sees that when it's in blossom here comments on the, on the color of that. It's a two-tone purpley blue and there it looks more purple, but it, it's actually, uh, more bluer than that in, in regular light. Um, it does not blossom as, as long as this Ernest Markham, but uh, just the blossoms I grow it for. So Clematis are not the easiest to grow, but once they're established, they do well. But they need sun, they need well-drained, fertile soil. So you have to keep feeding them. And the roots need to be shaded. So that means that either you mulch it or plant some plants in the front so that the roots are shaded. And of course they need some sort of support. And uh, if we do something on dividing perennials, I'll explain Julie, <laughs> Julie how to, <laughs> what to do when the, when the, cause they can get too thick and then you need to um, do some maintenance on them. So Coreopsis, but the variety I like the most is Moonbeam. Um, Coreopsis blossom for quite a while. Like a lot of perennials don't blossom very long, but I find that this Coreopsis lasts a long time. It uh, blooms in sun and it's uh, drought for tolerant. So you can put it in a dry spot and it still does well. Delphiniums. <laughs> They're not the easiest to grow, um, but they're not if you take care of them. So they need sun to part shade. They like to be fed quite often. They need well-drained soil, but they also need enough moisture so they don't dry out. They need to be protected from the wind because the wind can knock them down. And to keep them looking fresh and and keep your plants going. They need to be divided about every three to four years or, or otherwise they can die out on you. Leading heart. This one is my favorite. It's called gold heart. And those leaves stay that color all, all summer long. Um, they like semi-shade, moist soil, and they're best if you leave them undis undisturbed because their their roots are kind of uh, mushy, and if you divide them, they, they doesn't it doesn't go easy. So just be careful. Echinacea or the coneflower, they're probably they're very low maintenance, very easy to grow. They're long blooming. You put them in sun to partial shade, they're drought tolerant, and they even do well in poor soil. Philandula, there's those pink blossoms I was talking about. They take semi-shade moisture, they're great near water, and the deer won't eat them. Helium, he, helium or sneezeweed. Well, that's supposed to be a, a sneezeweed. Um, this is probably one of the b best behaved plants. It 
it it stays in its place it gets a little bit bigger and it just very very uh, well behaved so it takes sun it's a great cut flower there's no maintenance to it and it's something that blossoms late august september Heliopsis, or the false sunflower, um, well-drained soil, sun. It's not a heavy feeder, and it, uh, in other words, you don't want to put a whole lot of compost on it. Deadhead it to keep from self-seeding, because it will seed. As long as you deadhead, you got no problems. It's probably one of the longest flowering perennials there are. It will go from July to September. Daylilies. Now, like I said, I've got about 20 varieties. And these are some of the pictures of some of them. The sun to semi-shade. You need to divide if the if it stop if the blooming, it doesn't bloom very well. Once it's it stops blooming, that means it's it needs to be divided. Um I don't like I Anytime a clump gets eight to 10 inches, it's time to divide. Um, they'll do better. It tolerates most conditions. I have it just about everywhere, and it's very easy care. Um, if you can't grow a daylily, you can't grow much. <laughs> but I will tell you, please don't, unless you want to fight them, the, the orange daylilies out of the ditches, if you put them in your garden, you'll be pulling them out for a long time. Um, these cultivated ones never give me any trouble with uh, uh, coming up in any place other than where they're supposed to be. Corbels, uh, or Hershera, sun to shade, doesn't like soggy feet, but it growing for its foliage. You can see the different colors here. Um, really goes nice with uh, with hostas and uh, like these burgundy colored ones I like near my yellow hostas. They make the yellow hostas pop. Um, so, uh, and, and many of these, uh, these ones, the ones in the lower right hand corner, I started those from seed uh, 20, uh, 25 years ago, so and they're still growing strong. Hibiscus. Did you know these are perennial hibiscus that I started 25 years ago from seed? And uh, they put on such a show in uh, September, late August, September, October. Um, those those blossoms are the size of a dinner plate. So they need um, a moist soil, sun. They're like a bush, so they need lots of room. And the last thing that comes up in the spring are my hibiscus. And they'll have these awful brown sticks sticking out of the ground. And I think... Um, People have got them from me through the years and many don't survive for people. And I don't understand because I've never lost a one, never lost any. I've only gained, but uh, I think it's because people don't realize that how late they come up. They don't come up till June. And sometimes it's not till the 10th of June. So, and then by fall, they're, they're like, they look like this. They're beautiful. Hostas, well, I guess that's kind of my specialty here with over 200 varieties. So there are some hostas that are good for sun. Some actually do need some sun to bring out the color. And then there's some that are just prefer the shade. So it depends on the variety. And they tolerate most soil conditions. I have them next to the pond. I have them right up to tre against trees and dry shade. Um, but they like moisture retentive, well-drained soil. And they're pretty easy to look after. Iris. 
now there's different kinds of virus, of course. Now, there's these are the water fly viruses down in the, the yellow ones. There's the bearded viruses. You can see I have some with the variegated foliage. Now they go in sun to partial shade. Water irises, of course, like the moisture. Bearded irises need well-drained soil or their tubers will die, it will rot. And the tubers of the bearded iris need to be half exposed. You only partially bury them. Um, well, that's pretty much for iris. Most people know how to grow iris. But these are my showstoppers. These are the Japanese iris. And they like moist soil and sun, and they're very easy care as long as they're they're near my stream there. And uh, they put on a show in uh, July. In July. Shasta daisy. The care is minimal. Well drained soil. Um, they should just abide in them every three to four years to keep them looking fresh looking. And you can put them in sun to partial shade. And like I said, if they start um, um, tipping over or the stems aren't sturdy, don't uh, stop fertilizing them for sure. This is the blazing star or Leatris. So light shade to sun, they're drought tolerant, and they're one of the few flowers that actually thought they start flowering from the top to the bottom, not the bottom to the top, like most things. Um, they're a pretty easy care uh, plant, I find. Um, you just put them where you want them. Lagaria, now you can put them in sun, but you'd have to provide them with a lot of moisture. They need a lot of moisture. So, um, but they have that lovely, this, this, this one, Othelia, Othelo, um, has beautiful foliage. It's burgundy underneath and that coloring with some lighter colored green in front really is striking. There's my, some of my lilies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so lilies, of course, like sun, they're well-drained soil, and they're bulbs that multiply, most of them multiply very quickly, although, and of course, the con is a, prone to lily beetles. Um, the, especially the Asiatic lilies, will the bulbs will multiply quite quickly, I find, and uh, um, the one on the left is called uh, under lilies is sorbet. And I'm not sure the red the red one. And then we have the stargazer and lollipop. Anyway, I have a I don't know a lot of different lilies. Lynches or Maltese cross. Um, they take sun. Fertile, well-drained soil. This recommended variety is molten lava. I really like it because the foliage is a little bit um, burgundy tinged and it really pops with that uh, scarlet red blossom. And these are a seed I started over 20 years ago. Gooseneck, sun to part shade. It behaves better in drier soil. Mine is planted in a big pot that has the bottom removed so that it doesn't um, go all over the place. It, it keeps itself contained that way. And it's great for flower arrangements. Lupins, sun to partial shade. Leaves seed heads on if you want it to self seed, but they're not very pretty. And that's a uh, deer resistant. Bee balm, 
sun to light shade, needs good air circulation to prevent mildew. Um, so you, if you do water, water it at the base of the plant. I find that the centers will die out. So what I do is take, if you notice the plants on the outer edges will be much more vigorous. And I so I dig out the dead stuff and just bring in the outer edges into the middle um, when necessary. The beard tongue, sun to semi-shade, takes well-drained soil and it's drought tolerant. Peonies, sun or semi-shade. If you need to move them, do it in August or early September. And they will not bloom well for a couple years after they move after you move them. Phlox. The sun to part shade needs good air, air circulation. And I can't see, um, Julie, what's printed at the bottom. Can you? Uh, prefers moist, well-drained soil. Drained soil, okay. Now the, the first picture the, on the left of flocks is what they call the ground flocks. Um, the flocks, the blata, I believe that it is. So that's just a, a ground phlox that, and they they blossom in um, May, June. The others um, blossom later in the season, the taller ones, and you have to uh, just make sure they're in some place where there's wind, the wind can go through the leaves so that you don't get as much mildew. And there are some, um, you just have to, you'd have to check when you're getting varieties. Some are more uh, mildew resistant than others. The only thing I find about phlox is um, if you move them, it's hard to get all of the roots out and you can fight with them for quite a while after you've moved them from, a, from one bed to another. Where they were, they tend to still be coming up years later. So they're not an easy thing. Um, to move. So I suggest if you're going to put them in your garden, be sure you want them there for quite a few years. I think this is something that um, a plant that people don't take benefit enough. This is Jacob's Ladder. These blossoms are actually more bluer than they look. Um, sun to partial shade is actually best with some shade. And it has lovely foliage after it's done flowering and you deadhead and you don't get any seeking if you deadhead. Primula or primrose, that's an early flowering, very low ground cover, um, shade or semi-shade. I find the older varieties are much more dependable. Those both pictures were older varieties, those ones. Sedum, um, the ones that I've got pictures of now are all the taller varieties. They take, um, but there's a lot of the stone crop uh, ground covers too that are easy to grow. They take sun, dry soil, and they're undemanding and rewarding. The globe flower, it takes partial shade, a rich moist soil and can be grown in foggy conditions. This is really what it is, is, is a uh, perennial uh, buttercup. They're really quite nice. They, they flower in, in June, so they're an early flowering plant. Okay, so other perennials that I have in my gardens that um, I don't have a slide for are the balloon flower, which had the purple flowers that were in the middle of my, uh, by the swing there. Blue beard, which is actually a, a gray foliage plant that has uh, purple flowers. 
the creepy Jenny, which I'll show you in another slide later. Euphorbia is actually that yellow um, under perennials. Yeah, that's Euphorbia. And it, it's actually from the, the uh, Polenzetta family. And it blossoms in June. Um, that particular one, that one's, uh, yeah, that's Euphorbia. And it, it um, makes like a bush after which is nice. Uh, fever pew is the, is the picture of the one underneath it. And that is one thing that, like I said, will seed. And so I, I try not to mulch too much around it. Gold fountain is actually the, those yellow flowers in either, either corner. Um, uh, it's a, a Rubecchia. Geraniums, are, well, you can see one picture in the bottom corner on the, on the right. Um, they're in easy care. Um, you can put them in some semi-shade is probably about the best for them. Lamb's ear. Lamb's ear is um, uh, a gray um, leaf plant that is so soft. It's incredible just to feel it. You grow it, I think, just to, to touch the plant. Um, I cut off the, the uh, blossoms because I don't like the blossoms, but... Uh, it just gives some gray uh, foliage in the garden. Lily of the Valley, put it where you don't, where you don't care if it goes all over the place because it will spread all over the place. So put it somewhere where you don't care if it goes all over the way, all over the place. Um, lungwort is, uh, or pulmonia, um, grows in shade it has um, blue and blossoms and pink well like very they go from one to the other i can't remember if it's pink to blue or blue to pink and um, there are spring flowering plants the painted daisies are what you see there the daisies the 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 very deep pink and the light pink yeah um they're one thing Again, that doesn't need much fertilizing or the, the blossoms will just flop on you. Sea lavender is not easy to grow around here and doesn't always do that. It takes sun dry and uh, it looks like a, a big uh, bouquet of baby, purple's baby breath, really. It's, uh, Solomon seal, I just didn't have a picture of it in blossom around here. Um, I, it will grow under trees. So wherever there's dry shade, I've got it in places where you wouldn't think anything would grow and it grows. And, and uh, it has those, it grows about three feet tall uh, and it has these arching um, uh, branches. And then the, the, the white little uh, blossoms that hang down off of the, the stems in uh, June. And Sierra is this is a very, it's a miniature type of corabelt. That's what that is. Now, these are what I sort of perennials and microclimates, and these are some of the perennials that aren't supposed to. I'm not supposed to be zoned for it, but I do have. And, and this is the bed most of them are in. And, and it's because of the pond and it, plus it's pretty protected here. So um, the plants do well. So this is yellow wax bells and it grows in moist, rich soil in semi-shade. It's a late blooming, it's August and September. And once it's established, you don't have to do anything to it. You hardly have to divide it and don't do anything if you can get it. But it's supposed to be zone five. So it's not supposed to do that well here. This here is the Japanese forest grass. And again, um, it's zone five, semi-shade to shade, takes moist, well-drained soil, but it's really pretty. It, it, doesn't show up real good in the picture, but it's that it's really nice yellow um, and, and it has that drape, draping um, 
flow to it and it's really nice. And then the cross crocus mia, whatever it is there. It's such a stunning plant when it does it when it's in bloom. And uh, again, it's the zone five. Um it, it's like little bulb corns or bulbs, and uh, you just divide them in, in spring if you need to. Okay, and then I have some perennials that I grow for containers. And you can see now, this is lamian. And I grow different lamians, um, not just this one, but this one is the variegata. And I use it for hanging um, trailing plants in my containers. And in the fall, I just put them in the ground and in the spring, dig it up, divide it and put it back in my pots. And rather than paying dollars and dollars for uh, hanging for trailing plants, I just have them in my garden. So this is lamian and there's, I have different lamians that grow in, in uh, shade in the garden. Um, there's all sorts of, and this is creeping Jenny. If you can see the, at the bottom, those little yellowish leaves. Yep, yep. That's creeping Jenny and they sell a lot for a trailing plant in the, in the, in the nurseries. And, you can grow that in shade to sun. It grows almost everywhere. And it's a good ground cover. It, and um, like I said, I can use it in trailing plant in, as a trailing plant. And then if you can just see in, in the, on the right hand side at the top there, those yellow leaves, yeah, that's pineapple upside down hosta. So I put, Pastas in for and my pot pots when I'm mixing up things so, um, just to get a different uh, color in there. That's the end of it. So mm -hmm. we can um, we can. We can turn our cameras on in a minute, except I am going to, sh we can turn our cameras on, but I'm going to share the picture of Marilyn's root knife. Yeah. I think that this is very cool. <laughs> you find it? <laughs> there we go. Marilyn's root knife. Okay, that's the one tool when I'm dividing perennials that I can't do without. And if you've noticed, I painted the handle red because I've lost it a couple of times. So I painted it red so I could plant because when you're, it was just a, 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 a brown and when you're digging in dirt, it could disappear pretty quick. So that that is, they do sell them at, at uh, Lee Valley, but uh, it's so good for dividing day lilies or like I said, even the, the um, uh, the pearl there, the white, the white one, where I dig around the the roots. I just take that and and uh, cut where I want the the plant to be and and dig out the the what I don't want. So that that's an invaluable knife for me. Well, that was great, Marilyn. We did had a tour of of all perennials that you possibly <laughs> want. So many perennials. Um, I think it would be it, 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 it's so informative and, and interesting. Hope people were able to take notes, but we have recorded the presentation. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording.